Welcome back, everybody. The SPL rages on. We're only two sets in. Hard to believe. It's just stock full of NA action here today on a Friday night. Agro joined by Taco on the desk. And Taco, after Space Station, looks really, really good in a 2-0 victory against D-United. Now they've got to go up against Trifecta. Andy was being serious when he said he was no longer trolling on Twitter. And it seems as though Twitter has had a lot of influence over these players lately. We've got Captain Twig breaking out Arachne, and he's not trolling anymore. It, it's a good year for Smite. Well, Space Station started off with their 1-0 victory, but they aren't quite done yet. Again, they're going up against Trifecta next. But up until this point, you're standing. CLG alone at the top at 2-0, but Space Station now looking to join them. E-United all the way at the bottom with that 0-2. A lot of upsets already in Season 5. I don't think anybody would have ever predicted that E United would be bottom of the barrel, but with all this talent in the SPL, and again, only two sets have been played at most for a lot of these teams, so right. still way more to come and more opportunities for these players to prove themselves. Still plenty of time in the spring split, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't just rush to the next set, which is this one, set Space Station versus Trifecta. Trifecta played earlier today. That was our first look at them. They ended up going 2-1, losing that set with Counter Logic Gaming, but they, had, they showed some flashes there, particularly Scary D looked pretty good, and Met Yankee and Zatman both had at least one good performance in that game too, but also seemed to have a little bit of struggles in that set as well. There did seem to be a, a lot of struggle, mostly coming out of Zatman in the on the Hunter role, but it, things could be a little bit difficult. It, he did get focused out a lot by Counter-Logic Gaming, and Homie in particular was nonstop hammering down in his lane in games one and three, and those were respectively the ones that he ended up dropping, but that sole performance that he had in game two, Zat looked solid. He really did, and Soul is definitely Definitely one of the, the top tier gods right now to be played in the mid lane or in the duo lane, but Zap really showed us why in that game number two. Zap, I mean, he, he took that break a little bit a little bit ago during season four, came back to play in season five, and then didn't have the finish to the year that I think he really wanted. Do you think it just taking him a little bit of time to ramp up, or was that just a, a particular focus from CLG that made him not, not look so great in that A, a little bit of both, I, I want to say. I don't think that it's ever particularly one thing that ever leads to a player struggling through these kind of time periods. He's got a really strong roster surrounding him. I think that this is the team that's definitely going to help him with bouncing back. At the moment, though, from what we have seen out of Zetman, he's really just trying to improve his personal performances. I'm sure that as a player, he's never really going to be satisfied until he finds himself at the top. Well, uh, it turns out that he's had a pretty story matchup with his lane opponent this time around. Space Station Gaming, of course, making some changes. Barracuda and Jeff Henla going from Luminosity to SSG this time around in Season 5. Baron Zap have uh, had a couple face-offs in the dual lane over the years. Just a few. I might have seen each other and had to go like against each other passing, every, every yeah, now and the then. Hall, it's like yeah. a, hey, dude, can you chill this game? And be like, yeah, I got you on the next one sort of a fiasco, but uh, really, uh, when it comes down to these two hunters, Barra and Zap is a story as, as old as Smite itself almost by this point. Uh, they've really gotten used to each other's play styles, and if you ask Barra what he thought about Zatman's play style in Season 4, he would probably yell at you something, Zatman playing too much PvE, Jingwei, AFK farm, but you know what? It worked. Yeah, and it did. it was pretty great, and I, I think that now, though, Zap, again, is really trying to develop more of that somewhat aggressive play style. I don't think he wants to just sit back anymore. I think that he wants to be right in the thick of things again. I mean, old habits die hard after all. That's true. I mean, we saw it in their first setting on CLG in game one. Him and Snoopy duking it out. It was one auto apiece to find the solo kill. Snoopy ended up on top in that one. But still, Zapman definitely in the mentality still there. We'll see if the mentality stays in this set as they go up against Space Station Gaming Game 1 between SSG and Trifecta. SSG in that first pick position and if you, uh, if you are just joining us, you missed an individual performance like we haven't seen in a little bit. Aninster got that first pick dodgy in the last set and just just took E United to school with it and was able to really carry that one. If Trifecta don't ban it away, well... Keep them peepers open because it's going to be a crazy game, I'm sure, from Andy. All these players are just burning through these picks and bans right now. So far, going to be eliminating some of the more obvious choices. Uh, Kamazots, Uller, Nemesis, Thoth. No real surprises from any of these gods. We saw what a Kamazots can do uh, against a, a few teams already in Trifecta. Wow. They just don't want to deal with it again. First pick, Habwa, Dodgy on the table. I mean... I know it feels like it, Anister just made all the plays, but I guess Space Station willing to say that 
he'll be able to make plays elsewhere with a different god or potentially even with his hobble on the jungle. Dodgy is still available, but as far as a direct 1v1 matchup, the Habwa could be flexed for either the mid lane role or the jungle role. It's still a possibility here for Space Station, considering that Trifecta did elect to just secure their dual lane pretty early on here. And actually, I take that back because you never really know if that's going to be a flex pick as well yeah. for Trifecta. Could be. And Habwa, Dodgy. Do you think Space Station is like, yo, are you guys like, do we have to do the rest of this draft? I mean, you could blind pick us the last three and. We'll probably be happy with it. Hobble is a character that we saw a lot of bans at the beginning of the week and, and a lot of teams really focusing him out, making sure that no one was grabbing him. Then teams realized that no one was picking him, so they don't really have to ban him anymore. This is going to be one of our first opportunities to really see what he can do in NA. I know we saw him over in Europe a little bit, but that didn't end up working out. Do you feel like Habwa is, is first pick worthy here for Space Station? Habwa, especially in Season 5, has been the epitome of that feast or famine type of god. If if you don't get off to a phenomenal start, I'm talking first blood, double kill, maybe even throw in a third one for the hell of it, you are probably going to have a pretty bad time on this guy. At a competitive level of play, you're not working with a large health pool early no. on with this Habwa. Why? I mean, four to five hundred health is nowhere near enough to usually survive that burst potential from a lot of these assassins. And even the Robin pick here, I'm actually a pretty big fan of for Trifecta because I, I feel as though this is leaning more towards a jungler selection and yeah. a large reason being that he has that CC immunity on the overhead kick. Classic hub walk combination is typically water spout into the ultimate and there's really no way to avoid that because knockup is the best CC in the game. But right. I also am starting to believe that this Daji is probably going to be for Anansir and that the Habwa is most likely headed for Baskin. I mean, we saw it in the solo lane, I believe, in Europe. Uh, that I believe that was uh, SK that ended up trying to pull out something a little janky. Didn't end up working. So we could see it flex a couple different spots. We have seen Habwa ADC in the past as well. So I'm not ready to put it in pen for the mid lane, but I think that is where it fits best. I mean, that's what I think would be the best option. Just not sure if that's exactly where Space Station is going to go. A couple uh, different bands here looking at the Hunters for Trifecta. They ban away on her and Hachiman on the side of SSG, spreading out their bands between Geb for the support, Agni for the mid, Amaterasu could go to the solo lane or the support, but it seems like non-Guardian supports have really become the flavor for a lot of different pro teams. I, I almost expect this Ama to be support. I would have to probably agree with you on that one simply because Ardeo has so much survivability in the solo lane and probably gets a little bit more damage output as well whenever she can do that hybrid oriented kind of build, not really having to go full guardian potential. And on top of that, I, I think that they would have a little bit more mobility to match those rotations from Athena. I'm expecting Athena to be for Jeff Hinla here, but you yeah. never really know. The server is being locked away also could be a, a strong possibility for Space Station. I, I just expected to be that Athena for Jeff because what better way to assist the Daji and a Habwa than to have an Athena running around with them, dropping those Defender of Olympuses and the taunts just to burn actives. That's a great point. Kronos last pick here for Trifecta. I imagine that'll be Kronos in the mid lane, Hu Yi ADC, though we did see Hu Yi mid earlier on from CLG against this Trifecta roster. Taco, a couple of picks that we aren't really used to seeing here. Wh which draft are you favoring? Probably Space Station. I, I just think that a lot. It, it's hard to turn away from Danji Habwa, especially when I know that it's going to be Baskin and Anderson running them. Yeah, that's uh, th th those two played so well in the last game as well. You anticipate that they're going to be able to keep that rolling. And Cerberus makes it all the way down to the last pick here. That, that's been picked pretty early on. It seems to be one of those power solo laners right now. You know what hasn't been picked a whole lot as of late, though, is the Kronos. And yeah. we're really looking forward to seeing what NA is going to try and do with this god. And uh, all around, though, I, I still really feel as though Space Station's draft is favored just a little bit more with strong points throughout every stage of the game as opposed to Trifecta that seems to be favoring the mid to late. Well, there you have it. Game one picks are in. It's just got to get to the game. We've got the casters to bring that to you. Thank you, Ryan and Taco on the desk for us. Finch and Tom here, a team we don't get to see a whole lot, but I'm thinking that you guys are really going to like it. Space Station Gaming going to be uh, trying to find another win here today, Tom. Yeah, against Trifecta, yeah. Zapman's team earlier, we got to see a little bit of Trifecta. Not exactly at the strength I think they that they would have liked coming into the season, but I've said it a number of times. I'm actually very high on this roster. I think that they're going to do very well, but there is some ramp-up time compared to what Space Station Gaming is because their core has already played together. And then they add a new player 
who played with them years ago and um, won a world championship. So SSG might have a little bit in, of an easier time adjusting to Season 5. Trifecta is going to take a little bit more time to get the engine warm. We'll see if this game is it. Well, this is a tale as old as time, it feels like. Zapman and Barra going together in that Hunter lane. I mean, we've been seeing this for, for as long as you could have seen it. One thing we don't always get to see, though, is a haw blob make it through getting picked. That could yeah. easily be a big determining factor in this. There's a reason it is first banned all the time. Yeah, I mean, very often, Habois has come through and just been devastating. Oh, yeah. His damage is very high, and for a long time, Habois has been the same character. But in Season 5, 1, he's able to play the jungle. It's easier to kill those jungle camps, so his early game is easier to get through and get that experience. And, of course, he's less susceptible to the inevitable invade because the speed buff is tucked away in the back also very rarely he does make it into the mid lane a little bit of a secondary position as hilarious as that sounds <laughs> but it's because the rotations are less are, are, are harder to execute without getting punished so how about a little bit safer there these days in season five yeah, and i gotta think that his you know the, the atlas of the yellow river that's that's his real name right we always call it the water car the wet paper <laughs> the wet paper i gotta think that helps out too with nemesis so strong in the meta right now right that that slow immunity for not just you but the whole team can really shut that down we saw it being prioritize a sprint was picked up early yeah. just to try and counter that nemesis so that slow immunity really can't be big but we're uh -oh. into the game not just into the game we're right into a kill already in trouble is jeff inla med yankee gets first blood right away I am, th this is a lineup that I want to see Trifecta on. Met Yankee with a hunter in that mid lane. This guy, for all of my money, was just flat out a better hunter than he is a mid laner. But a mid laner playing a hunter? I'll go for it. Yeah, we do have a brief pause coming out there while we're getting everything situated with our players, but already Jeff Hinla in the ground. I mean, that was very, very early, so not as impactful as it can be later True. on, but a kill that early always helps. Exactly. It's just raw. Uh, the, the raw gold that you get for the bounty on yeah. top of it. A lot of times there's a couple of variables involved in that. Well, how much was that first play? No, the game didn't even start yet. Down <laughs> he goes, 400 in the pocket. Yeah, so they get that bounty. And normally what really happens on the kills is not even just the kills. It's, it's you know, losing camps after, losing farm, not being yeah. there to meet your wave. So they're not going to get that punishment after this. You traditionally get, you want me to say stuff after the stuff? Is that it? Is that what's happening? Is that what I'm seeing right now happening? Uh, hey, Live. You, you, you said it. Where, I, where'd you get that from? <laughs> I made it up today. No one's ever heard it before. This is a game of chicken that I'm not <laughs> willing to play, unfortunately. Brief pause here as we're starting our Space Station Gaming versus Trifecta match. Getting right back into the action in just a moment, but 86% wow. think that Barra and the boys can do it again. Well, that's pretty impressive. Maybe it's because, uh, you know, they thought it was United playing again. They were, they were confused about that. I, I mean, I, I don't think that's the case. I think that <laughs> Barracuda and Jeff Hinlaw are some of the, the crowd favorites here. Sure. Um, yeah, I think that's just the fact of the matter. Though. No, I mean, I agree with you. The Space Station roster is so strong, and it's a lot of love for Jeff and Barra, you know, and I don't think that that's, that, that that's ill-gainer by any means. They're, they're, they're definitely great. They're both such good players. And then they're great in the community, too. They're yeah. cool guys. And, and, of course, you talk about the, the players around them, and and Sir. When, I mean, we just watched and and Sir go off and, and trounce Scream's United, and, and Scream goes ahead and tweets almost, like, in, in, in awe. Yeah. I got beat, but I he, he said something like, I hit tab at three minutes, and this guy has three kills. What's going on, gamers? And it wasn't a salty tweet. No. It was a, wow, this guy's incredible. And we're the defending world champion. It's it's hard. It it's, it's puts that much more emphasis. But at the end of the day, I think there is not a single soul that can watch this game, understand it, and not be impressed with what Anderster did in game number two in the last set. No, he truly, truly went off and... Trying to see maybe he can go off himself here is Met Yankee. Again, he was the one that got that first blood. Going to help him out. Going up against this Hebo in mid lane, we talked a little bit about how his rotations can be strong, all that. But in lane, he's such a bully too. So much damage that he's able to do between the water spout and then following up with that first ability as well. So anything to try and help even that out is going to go a long way for Met Yankee. Yeah, it's one of the nice things that uh, the Ho Yi selection is going to do for him versus the Habwa. He'll find some good clear by way of the ricochet and doesn't have to get up close and personal too often. Matt Yankee's actually going to have the pressure and push into the jungle. Nice steal of the red buff by himself. Able to get that picked up, and Barracuda 
getting to see how fun it is going up against this Kronos over here in the duo lane. We're seeing a little bit more of this mage ADC happening here, Tom. For a while, it was kind of just soul, but now we're starting to see Kronos come in here as well, and he can be very strong with that second ability, which can augment his auto attacks, add additional damage, and even without that, we're seeing him bully here in lane. Let's go. That's my Kronos impression. It's good. And you know, it's interesting. We Very little Kronos. He's he's sort of the... He, we're getting there. That man yeah. is liked the Kronos, and he plays it well, which is why I think we're seeing it. And also to offset the physical damage, of course, that's going to be over there in the mid lane. People kind of spread out here, but other side. First Blood already happened, don't forget. So, Mask picking this one up. Wow, now not only does Baskin take the spill, but Met Yankee gets first blood earlier. This could potentially spell problems there in mid lane for Baskin on this hob blob pick. How well he can farm back and try and make up for some of these early losses. That's going to be real important for him. So right now, what I want to see these players transition into is really just power for Baskin. I want to see Space Station Gaming really work together to get Baskin, maybe not a lead, two to four. That might be a little bit of a pipe dream here, but I want to see Baskin at least catch up. I think it's very important for this Hob Y if he's going to make an impact. Here early in the game, Baskin is kind of the center focus for them, but I hard not to want to focus on Anster on this dodgy after what we saw him do with this pick earlier on. I mean, two and a half minutes, he doesn't have a kill. Kind of feels like he's slowing down a little <laughs> bit just based on what he showed us there before. But I mean, all joking aside, he's, he, he's certainly doing fine here this game. Got, looks like he's got, you know, the boots one, tier attendance one. This is the start we see a lot where you go in and get the boots, then you want to go into uh, Transcendence. Sometimes we see Crusher in that slot too. So Andy's going to have some options about how he wants to move along through this build and try and repeat what we saw from him earlier. Yeah, undoubtedly, I think it's going to be the Transcendence. The cooldown reduction on completion of the item makes this such a more powerful pickup. Junglers were a little trepidatious about picking it up once upon a time, and now there's just no reason not to. It used to put you down a little bit. It was very expensive, but getting that 10% CDR right away is really important. Big damage boost as well as Daji scales extremely well. Yeah, and, and Anister showed us what this Daji pick can do uh, uh, playing around the ultimate, yes, but even without that ultimate, too, just being able to catch you off with that horrible burns, with the extra movement she's able to get off that second ability, even if she's not able to land that Pala, which he did perfectly fine, by the way, he can still make this dodgy pick work for him. So there's so many options for Aninster for how he wants to try and help out now that Baskin's a little bit behind there in mid lane, that Jeff Hinla took that spill earlier. They certainly still have plenty of ways back in this. So watching these teams kind of banging out here against different opponents. Trifecta we've seen play earlier in the day and Space Station we've seen play earlier in the day. Yeah. Uh, for me, Space Station Gaming has just been about raw, just like crushing people. And for a long time, this roster, the Jeff Hanla Barracuda, Baskin sort of uh, grouping this, this unit, one of the problems for me over the past couple of years has been their lack of creativity. I constantly say you can't follow the meta if you want to be the leader. And Space Station Gaming, previously different banners, have always Always kind of left me uh, left a little bit to be desired in the in the creativity they kind of just followed blindly now seeing the double assassin combination having Baskin play stuff like this I, I really like where this team is going space station gaming might be one of the more formidable opponents here in season five I want to point out as well man Yankees been able to finish off that transcendence already he's got 19 stacks on that too so He's in a good spot. If they fight soon, I mean, certainly I imagine Bass going to be able to go back and finish up an item here shortly. That just depends on if Met Yankee wants to try and force any kind of fight. The red buff is coming up. I'm not sure if he knows it's down here. Instead, though, Bass going to be able to pick this one up. No problem uncontested. Yeah, very important. Baskin understood that he got invaded on the first round of the red buff. So here Baskin making very sure that he's able to pick this up after the fact because if he's staying in lane, that's why we see him give up the wave onto the tower. If he stays in lane, looks for that, then he's going to get invaded a second time. He needs the red buff in order to dance with the Met Yankee. So he makes that choice and kind of gives up some of that farm in lieu of the red. Oracle's going to be going the way of Space Station is... Looks like Met Yankee and Nehru Mob decided to just come back over there to pick up that red buff. Mask, on the other hand, is rotating in, and Mask is on that Robin jungle pick. And even though that is a warrior, I imagine Mask is going to be building this almost entirely damaged. That's what we've seen from this Robin here lately. It can do so much damage from the jungle with that ult. Yeah, I mean, for me, Robin, when it comes down to uh, class distinction, I take it with, with, with half a grain <laughs> of salt, man. Freya is a mage. Alquan's a mage. We're talking about an assassin, hunter, hybrid, and a 
pure assassin there, right? So when I look at... Oh, this is trouble. Good blink together. It's actually not trouble, by the way. He's really? just gonna leave. That was that was that was that was hot. He's just like I'm out. Um, but what I was talking about with, with about uh, classes, Robin is a warrior, and so he gets some of those stats that warriors will get. But his his the way he functions in practice is absolutely an assassin because he has damage reduction on the ultimate and the the immunity on the flip kick. He can itemize all aggressive and still have that innate tankiness. So yeah. So, yes, he's a warrior by definition, but a lot of times we just see him as an assassin. He did just come over to the solo lane and try and give Aquarius a bit of a hard time. Aquarius is, though, level 8 on the Cerberus, so he's not really going to be paying too much mind to it, able to back up and get out of there just fine. Looks like Warrior's Blessing's been finished for both of them, too. They've got full boots a-rockin'. So these two solo laners, probably going to be, for the most part, okay over here in this solo lane, unless we get, like, a hard commit from one of these assassins. Both, yeah, both assassins going with the teleport as well, so not really a team fight relic or a one versus one relic at looking for the kills. This will likely be a very passive, passive, passive lane. Scary D, though, I want to point this out. Scary D on the Amaterasu. Now, I have been one of the most scathing critics of this solo laner, but... I totally give credit where credit is due. And Scary D on this Amaterasu, whenever he's had the good games, it has been on this Amaterasu. We'll leave the Vamana out of the conversation. <laughs> but the Amy from Scary D has always been very impressive. So I'm excited to watch this. Looks like they're trying to come down here towards this blue buff, his mask. And by trying to, I mean it's done. D -d 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 job's, job's done. Mask is able to drop that one, so that'll slow down Aquarius a little bit more over here in the solo lane. But, Tom, you touched on that teleport they both picked up. We saw Fine OK playing that earlier with those teleports on the back line of Sobek. They were huge. These teleports can absolutely be a big deal if you can time them perfectly and come in the back. Nice little initiation here in the taunt. middle lane, but a double taunt coming out from the support player. And there's the kill onto Nehrumar. Baskin finds that one much needed for the mid lane hob wall and gets the chain pull too. Not really any get a follow up available for it, but Defender of Olympus has been channeled. That's much needed as well. Very low already is Baskin and jumping up is Met Yankee. He wants to find a ricochet, ricochet to try and settle this one. Ricochet! Down. Long range! Blew gets him, him from all the way out of town! <laughs> Wonderful stuff from. The Long Islander. Yeah, we knew it. Med Yankee had that one lined up. Sometimes with those ricochets, we say, all right, all right, you got that ricochet. <laughs> Med Yankee knew that one, though. He had him lined up for it, gets that kill, and they needed it, too. 2-0-1 -oh for the mid laner for Trifecta. I knew, I, I knew it from the way he was walking yeah. towards the player. <laughs> and like I said, man. He's walking like a protractor, right? <laughs> he, he, he's a hunter player by default. Give him these choices in the mid lane. Right now, uh, Scary D going to pop the ult. I don't think anything's going to happen there, but that play brought to you by Mask. I love it. This is similar to what we saw Panicat do earlier on. Defense by way of offense. His buddy's in trouble. So instead of kind of helping out, just jump into the enemy and say, look at me instead. And <laughs> bad stuff for Space Station Gaming. Nice turnaround by Try. It really was because I think Anister got Anister came in and got the... He, he set up the kill for them. He got the pull off that pal out, too. They just ended up getting blown up in return. Raskin was so low. They both were at the end of that fight. So in the end, they managed to get that cleaned up. Does met Yankee and the rest of the boys. A trifecta now up 3-1 to one in the kills. And enjoying about... 1,500 or so gold, maybe a little bit less than that. So not really anything true tremendous here as we start to approach 10 minutes into the game. See a little bit of that wave sharing coming out from Andy. Wanted to uh, make sure he was able to share that without showing himself in the lane. And these are the small things. Hiding hiding the information from your opposition, very important. And he could have very easily just went up there, stood next to Barra and said, thanks for killing the minions. Did you get your stacks? But instead, hides of the juggler. You saw him kind of inching up, making sure, because that's a really, he was far away from the wave, just getting as as far as possible away from the wave while still getting that gold and experience. The really fun stuff. Taunt comes out in the mid lane. Immediate response is the blink over the wall from Mask. Low is Baskin. He's going to have to leave, so it won't have his damage to follow up. Much ado, though, perhaps about nothing. The ricochet comes through, doesn't quite hit, so they'll back up for now. Fun. And again, the ricochet hits him. I mean, that's a it's almost the same shot, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Matt Yankee. I mean, this is this is uh, this is what I want to see him do every game. Just give Matt a hunter every game. He, it's it's worlds of difference versus when he's playing a mage. 
and hunters right now when they're in the mid lane, it works so well for them because there's so much farm they're able to get here, rotating around to these harpies as well. They'll get ahead a little bit of those 80 carries. By the way, Jeff was behind the camera, but I was watching the life bar. Matt hit that one too. Yeah. Met's just, that's just Metnian. He's, he's good on this OE pick. I wanted to point out here, one's been dropped down, but three sentry wards were picked up by Trifecta. Is that an aggressive call from them or trying to be defensive here against Space Station to control that vision is my question. Th th this is this is about aggression. A uh, lot of players are picking up the, the Oracle Chalices, 400 gold, uh, and you're, each ward is 50 bucks, right? So you're getting so much value as long as you're able to place two, four, six, eight wards. And guess what? Everyone places more than eight wards. So you're getting your money's worth easy peasy. The century wards coming out from Trifecta are to ensure that they're able to make the ganks that they want to. It's kind of like a beads check. You show up to a lane, and then you get seen on the ward, and you drop it. And you go, I'm coming back as soon as he forgets about me. Trifecta trying to set the pace here. Mask has been doing a good job of it with these blinks particularly onto Baskin there in the mid lane. We saw it in, the last, in that last fight. It's sort of like you said, instead of peeling, I'm going to come in and try and do damage. That's important too, not just not just for the peel's sake, but to prevent them from doing any kind of follow-up damage to his own back line. Mask has been strong for him here so far, and they got a three-man grouping in mid. Lurking over to the side is Ann and Stir. He wants to try and be a part of this, but this tower is already low. They might just be trying to push it down. Taunt does come out with the immediate blink response in. Crushing through the team fight is the Habwa, though. Baskin eventually does end up finding Met Yankee and the pull on the Paolao. Make that a double kill for Baskin. He finds there in the mid lane. That push did not work. This play brought to you by Andenster. Jumps over the wall and again, the hiding of information. I'm going to sound like a broken record. The fact that Andy is so slippery and so clever with the way that he walks around this map is going to be the reason that Space Station Gaming finds themselves with a number of W's. Trifecta look at that situation, they assess it and go, we've got the numbers, but surprise, Mama Jamma, here comes Andenster. Grab in two, and then just setting up his mid lane hobwa for everything. I asked earlier, I said, I need Anister to help Baskin out and get him back in this game. What are the two mid laners at right now? 3 2 0, 2 1 1. And a level lead for Baskin as well. 13, well, just now taking over to 13 was Met Yankees, about a half level lead or so in Baskin's favor. But you're exactly right. I mean, Anister has been putting Baskin in a perfect position so far throughout this game. Yes, he's taken those two spills, but as we saw, one came early on in the game. And he's been able to get off that ultimate to multiple members, being able to finish off these kills. He's in a much better spot now than he was. Exactly how I want this team to play. Exactly how I want this team to play. And it's there in Baskin. And, it, and you, you know, it's great. You talk to players that have switched roles in the past. And uh, specifically, support. Specifically, I'm bringing up Cherio. When he went from Guardian to support, to, uh, when he went from support to jungle and back and forth, essentially, uh, you know, he was like, you know, it's, it's it's seeing the world through a different pair of glasses and understanding what your teammates are doing is a big deal. Rewind comes out from Zapman. Perfectly positioned, though, was Barracuda. Gets a stun out, tries to immune that by going up into the pal out. Mass, though, blinks over and blows Barracuda up. Now it's three members aggressing onto Anister. He tries to get the return damage. Aegis is good to keep him alive. Baskin actually oh. found Neruma, and Jeff Hinla comes in and blows up Zapman. That makes it two for two. Baskin now still has plenty of damage available to him. He's looking for a little bit more. Mask trying to fight with those huh? in hands, gets taunted in. Met Yankee finally gets the reset, but not enough. Baskin blows him up. The Tables have turned, Plink? but we still sitting Ooh. at him. Baskin finds a long range shot for the duple. Ooh. That's four members dead for Trifecta. Space Station picks up two kills and it's nowhere close to that. The rotation from Baskin was huge for them there at the back end of that team fight. Comes in over on that water carpet, blows them up. So impressive. I, I, that's, there's a lot of times that I watch this team and I'm just at a loss for words. They're so incredibly adept at playing as a unit, making those rotations, making sure nobody's lost without, without somebody to play sort of backup for them. Just wonderful stuff. Again, Anister, that was the worst position we've seen Anister in. Not only does he turn and burn, but he's got his teammate in the jungle to help him out there. That's why we see him make the decision to go back in 
All fun stuff from Space Station Gaming. None of it an accident. But look at this aggression now. Space Station Gaming have pulled the Gold Fury. Jeff Henla's here. Zatman, or not Jeff Henla, rather, but Nayruman and Zatman are here. But they have nothing that they can do. Space Station take down that Gold Fury right in the face of Trifecta with a four-man rotation. Now they're the ones out in the lead with the gold lead to go along with that kill lead. <sighs> those, are the play those are the plays that hurt, Finch. Yeah. We see Trifecta have the lead early on. And then they're the ones that make the positive play. Trifecta are able to say, all right, Anster's going out of control. Yeah. He ganked and, and he got one of the kills, but we're able to shut him down. Look at us. Here we go. Three surrounding one. The Athena ult's coming in. We're still good. And then Baskin goes, JK, and just comes in and slaughters everybody. He does. And there's a reason that Hobbaugh's been first pick, first ban, because he can do things like this. I'll admit, of course, Baskin is exceptional. Sure. And, you know, he's making, he's playing Hobbaugh to the absolute peak, I believe, here right now. But that's what this god's capable of doing and why we've been seeing it so heavily prioritized. That now leads to this gold fury that we just saw taken for Space Station. Them reclaiming the lead, now they can start pushing it. Again, just an ultimate rough spot for Trifecta because yeah. not only did they have that positioning, that was their play to make, and they wound up losing it. But that was a goal. That's what we call an unscheduled goal fury. A lot of times people, a lot of times the teams will drop a play and say, we're going to make this play onto mid or duo or whatever to push out the pressure, and then after that, we'll be able to go ahead and claim our prize of the gold fury. Well, in this scenario, Space Station Gaming go, we just accidentally killed four of them. Let's pick up the gold. <laughs> And that's what they were able to do. Seven to five now are the, are the kills. 16 minutes into this one. And we keep talking about him because he's six, two, and zero right now. Baskin has been excellent for them this game. Uh, to say this game, though, feels like a disservice. Baskin is always excellent for them. Even if Space Station's behind, it seems like somehow Baskin's like three, two, and three or something. Right? <laughs> he's never, he's, everyone else might be negative, but never Baskin. It feels like he's just so strong for this team. That's why at, at Vegas, you heard P, P, PBM say it. If we can stop Baskin, I think we can beat him. Can you stop him? I mean, Baskin <laughs> has been the go-to player that you say is just the best. He, he is incredibly incredibly adept three players left side looking for Zatman yeah, this is Pow Wow gets pulled right back in three members here there's really nowhere for Zatman to end up going actually what? they back up off of him I think maybe they thought they'd gotten the kill already either way they do not find it Baskin is the one that ends up falling to the two man gank Zatman gonna just walk away from that one rare mistake from Space Station Gaming. I think you could make the argument that tri that the communication was given that Trifecta is killing people in their left side jungle, so the inevitable rotation is coming. But I think the commit for one extra basic Pyro. doesn't take that long. Pyromancer, that's going to be the call. Sunbreaker is dropped down to help them confirm it, and they do. That's going to go the way of Trifecta. Now with the Dazzling Offensive going, Iscarity trying to slow down Aquarius jumps right on over that one. Even though it's a big old Cerberus, he's able to nimbly jump out of the way of that, and he'll be fine. Baskin now sitting out for 10 seconds as he sat down and decision making, decision making, decision making. Anister is behind a level or about half to mask, but that's by design. He put himself in that position to enable Baskin to sort of get that lead. Yeah, and we mentioned that too. The rest of the team is a little bit is, is either even or a little bit behind, but Aquarius and Baskin are the ones who are still doing well for themselves, at least experience-wise, a little bit out in front of their direct lane opponents, about half a level there in Aquarius' favor, in favor. But you're right, this has been trying to get Baskin back from the early focus that he got earlier in the game. Trifecta have done this right. Sure, the hotball got through, and they said, we can't just let it farm. They've tried to focus it down. Yeah. It's just so difficult. Very much so, especially when you have the dual threat of and your Baskin. Basically, you can, sure, we can farm up Baskin, but then Andy's going to go ahead and get a lead. So we have to make sure that we pay attention, equal attention to both of these players. We watch what happened when Daji's allowed to do whatever she wants. So <laughs> everybody on Trifecta, very aware. What a luxury when you can describe the dual threat of Space Station Gaming and Barracuda's not in it. That yeah. is frightening, right? Also Barracuda. And, and and I'm not trying to say that you that you left anything out or forgot. You're right. And Anister and Baskin are nutty, and you've got to try and find a way to slow them down. It's a three-headed dragon now. Is this Space Station roster? It's part, I think, of what makes them just so scary. Yeah, three oh man, I wish I had a better analogy for it because the, the wonderful thing about the about the the triple threat, the true triple threat of Space Station gaming, is the fact that they all 
will come in at various points of the game. Andy is your early game guy. He's going to come in and just bite people's face off at like level one, level two. Like I said, scream hit tab at three minutes and he had three kills. What's going <laughs> on, homie? Right? Baskin is your mid lane mage. He's going to run the mid game. And then Barracuda shows up. Everybody's been ignoring him for 19 minutes. Then he shows up full build, level 20, and he's able to sort of put the dot on everything after the fact. So you've got three separate carries that excel at three separate areas of the game, which is what makes Space Station such a complete team. And that complete aspect is what makes them so scary. Pushing down this tier one tower in mid lane. They do have some more support lying in wait with the Andister over to the right. As you said, he very much likes to hang out in the jungle, but this time Trifecta have a ward over there. Actually have a couple wards. They certainly knew where Andernster was and would have been ready if he tried to jump in. They push forward to Trifecta. Now Space Station Gaming have to back up for now. Gold Fury's not up right now. Pyromancer's not up right now. So those big neutral objectives aren't available for them to push for. Instead, they're going to push for this Aquarius over here in the jungle. Backing up, though, is Mass. They recognize they probably can't take down the dog. Aquarius had pushed up that right side lane all the way to the Tier 2 tower. You can take a look at the minions just right up there. So he had started walking back after SSG had mentioned the rotation coming out from Trifecta. So very, very safe, clean and clear. No problem. Trifecta grouping up here on the left side. They know that Gold Fury is going to be spawning relatively soon. And Zapman does have a lot of the power ready to go right now. Yeah, Zapman's at a point where he's definitely ready to fight. He's got the Odysseus bow, the Devourer's Gauntlet, Transcendence fully stacked as well. And then with that Jingwei passive, those crits coming through certainly can make him potent. Even with that airstrike, he's got a chance to help contest over these Gold Furies as well. That's one of those things I think that makes Jingwei so strong. Yes, the passive is good for her in lane. Yes, being able to get the, the crit is also very good, but or off her, I think it's off her first ability, but it's the airstrike, that big sort of team fight ultimate that could be strong. Two man taunt though comes out on the mask and air mom. Maybe not the best ideal targets. No real immediate follow up there for basket. Nice jump. Aquarius gonna find players. Ooh. Nope. Yeah, double beats. Really cute. Aqua getting two beats for one ult. That's a nice look so far in that gold tree spawn. And again, timing everything. This is why Space Station was so aggressive. Zatman is here, and he's kind of the only one. Come around the backside is Scary D. He's ready to go straight Take in. Take the fight! He's level 20. He knows that he's tanky. Force uses ultimate war for defense than anything. His basket had Defender of Olympus channeling, but not going to get there in time. Scary D finds the Waterman. Now on the backside, Mass trying to get away from Barracuda. Answer had met Yankee on the top end of this team fight, while the 2v2 happens down here on the bottom. Space Station recognized they're bringing everyone down. Jumping over his Anister. That's a double kill for Anister on the Dodgy here in this fight. 4v3. They continue to push forward with their number advantage. Zapman's got to watch out, not just for himself, but for the opponent. Zapman needs to be dealing damage here. He's being very, very careful, which better safe than sorry, sure. But as he's able, he's at 4,700 damage right now. I, I need to see more from this Kronos. I, I think he's got some of the itemization, Finch. They don't have as much burst as you might if you had the mage alive. Oh. Trying to blink in with Scary D. That was a good idea. It just was not mm. quite enough. Space Station secure that gold fury, and now they're going to be able to get out clean. Love that play from yeah. Scary D. Love that play. Throw your body into it. Just absolutely go for it. If, you, if he dies, he dies. I just want to see him try. I've been impressed with Scary D here today, Tom. I don't know about you. In the two yes. sets that we've seen from him, I mean, he's looked great. And you're... You mentioned it earlier, sometimes, you know, we don't always give Scary D that much credit, but I think certainly he's earned it here today, and I agree. He didn't quite get that Gold Fury there, but, I mean, where his head was at was great. There was really no way for Space Station to prevent that. It was just a matter of if that timing was, was, was on point or not. In the end, though, Space Station get that Gold Fury. Now they're up about 2,000 gold. Still... Not a tremendous lead. I mean, Trifecta are hanging right there with them. Yeah, this is this is Trifecta is still 100% in this. And you know, like I said, the, the scary part of your Space Station gaming is the fact that Zapman has been so quiet. He's just sitting there in the corner, building up his itemization, and sooner or later, he's just going to explode. And it's not just the Kronos. There's a ho ye in mid lane, too. The later oh, this yeah. game goes, the more these auto attackers are going to start to be scary for you. No way for Trifecta to contest this, though. Pyromancer also going to go the way of Space Station Gaming. They pull that one for themselves and increase their lead out a little bit more. Not as much about the actual buff that you get from that objective as just taking that global farm. Divine Rune coming out from the Habwa wants to make sure that uh, he's going to be shutting the, uh, the damage down here. Interesting penetration choice here, and I want to break this down for the Fire Giant, so 
I don't know if I'm going to be able to. Spear of the Magus is mathematically probably the better option for penetration, but that's after you're casting a little bit. Hobble wants to make an impact like that, and that's what Obsidian Shard does. Have you ever gotten hit in the face of the Hebo and then dove in any further? Mask can say that he has. Defender of Olympus was channeled on top of Baskin, though, so no further aggression for it, but two ultimates committed from Space Station as well as from Trifecta. Yeah, so the, 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 the Spear of the Magus takes a little while to, to build up, and uh, like I said, probably the, the mathematical best option but in practice at this high level you don't get the up uh, you don't get the opportunity to sit there and repeatedly cast on players really uh, that often you, the idea of being able to free cast that's how you lose games so by bringing out the obsidian shard he's going to be able to make the impact without building up those passives and that's the biggest difference between what you do on paper versus what you do on the battlefield able to bully scary d over there in the solo lane was the three member strong of Space Station Games in Aquarius, Barracuda, and Jeff Hinla. Not going to be able to continue the chase, though, but at least force him back. He does have teleport available to him, so if that's something he wants to do, he has that option. But I don't think Space Station is going to force the issue too much. He'll have time to walk back in. Tier 1 Tower might be under siege, though, here in the mid lane. 25 minutes in, though. That's not a particularly huge deal. Trifecta won't cry too many tears over the loss of that structure. Aquarius is going to kind of slap over here on the right side of the fight. They're trying to see if they can earn some positioning, and Ooh. they do find the two-man taunt. Yeah, Hindler's kind of in a rough spot right now. Trifecta can just collapse on whomever they feel fit, but playing it safe. I like the retreat coming out from Space Station Gaming. That was not their moment. Yeah, Scary D does not want to retreat. Follow! Going to follow Baskin through and find that kill without a problem. Scary D's low. He's going to escape on the backside. Three-man taunt, it looks like, comes out, but there's really no immediate follow-up. Med Yankee is the one who's low, been pulled in by the Palau and taken down by the Palau. And Inster, happy to get credit for that kill. Zapman pushing forward. Haven't gotten to say his name much so far, but he's looking for a little bit more can't quite keep find chasing it keep chasing keep chasing trifecta there it is the blink in coming out from mask this is an opportunity trifecta Stun. are trailing and when you see the window open you go right on through and just snaps the pie scary d's hungry and he's bringing it home and zap man baby gets the double kill everyone from space station gaming has fallen except for anister who has to watch as the boys of trifecta walk home with a victory beneath their belt they haven't gotten very much off it though they couldn't get the tier two no gold fury up i mean what they get they, i mean they're able to punish space station gaming and from here they're going to be able to just farm up a little bit put some stuff in their pocket you're going to see scary d just push these minions on the tower uh, give it up give it up to this young man and 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 i realize the meme that, that I have been very critical of this guy and specifically his decision making. When I watched the games back after I second guessed myself, Scary D's decision making seemed so curious. He was hesitation and stuff like that that we're just not seeing. Space anymore. Station got it! <laughs> Space Station, that was Baskin. He's able to come in and take it. Now he's got Defender of Olympus channeling over the top of him. They actually have a chance to maybe even get a couple return kills here in this fight. Knocks up Nehru on top of the water carpet trying to avoid the slow. Scary D just doesn't have anything available to him right now. Pulling him back in and Anister find the kill. Matt Yankee gets a return one to Baskin. Lots of damage already gone, but the power out from Anister is double kill for him. Pull Scary D back in here. Get back here, boy. Knocking him down. Triple kill for Anister. What looked like a good fight for Trifecta has turned on its head. Quadra kill for Andenster. Quattro! Andenster, Andale! Heading up the right side lane. That fire giant attempt from Trifecta might have just lost them the game. Wow. Out of control. Wow. That is crazy. Baskin comes up with the back end, and they do correctly zone away Andenster. It was, it was the already on him particular. Go. They're going to go try and end this go. game. They're going to get a chance to break it down. The four members of Space Station Gaming are trying to take game one away from Trifecta after a four-man wipe. It looks like they should have taken the Fire Giant and been making their own push. Instead, only Zapman is left alive to try and defend on their health bars alone, but the Titan's health bar is even lower. Goes in for the staging and Torment. That's enough. Space Station Gaming find the win. The the absolute smallest of windows for a space station gaming Woo! if the if those if they killed four like andy gets the quadra kill if each person have five seconds less on their respawn timer yeah that game's not over the smallest of windows and i was giving scary d credit for decision making and i still will but on that note the decision making of space station to just go for the win and we saw the 
benefits of their team composition as well. Not only Baskin was there first, but as soon as Jeff Hamlin was back up, he could defend of Olympus right into that team fight. Able to survive through that engagement was Baskin as well with that water carpet. Excuse me a moment if I'm still recovering from the end <laughs> of that match. But let's see who you all thought was the real MVP of that game. I think I've got a pretty good idea, but there in Mixer Chat, we want you all to vote and give us your opinion on who it was that was the MVP. Baskin. Yeah. I Maybe answer. He's the one that got the quadra kill at the end, but you're right. Baskin got the fire giant that they needed. Wonderful stuff here. And again, Baskin sort of set up by the incredible prowess of Anderster. Baskin has a lot of trouble in the early game. If Anderster doesn't show up, trouble. This is why it's a team game. All five members, very important. Well, let's go ahead and get it over to the desk. We'll have Ryan and Taco break that one down. So there you have it. It was a pretty close game. Trifecta get the wipe. They go to Fire Giant, grab it, end the game. And what was it? Baskin? Baskin stole Fire Giant, and then SSG wins for free after that? That's what happened. This is by far the darkest timeline for a Trifecta. Losing a Fire Giant after just pretty much freshly de the enemy team outside of Andy. Andy was the only survivor during that last little skirmish there by the T2 Tower. The most stretched out chase I think that we've seen in quite some time. Starting off with Scary D actually picking off Baskin who tried to ult away and even through that untargetable Hawa ultimate still was not enough to escape the clutches of Trifecta but short-lived victory by the end of it all and a devastating defeat honestly if you think about it just going through all of that effort suffering the the early game struggles and then finally managing to have a recovery period just to be so shortly lived and Baskin to blink in and steal it with a three. I mean, it, it seemed this close. Like, you're right. Trifecta had turned the corner. They look like they're about to take it. Their late game is phenomenal between the Hu Yi and the Kronos. And then Baskin uh, snuffs out the fire, if you will, to, to quote FDOT. Rough stuff for Trifecta, who have looked pretty good today overall, but have not found the wins they wanted. Surprise, surprise, Baskin is your MVP for game number one. Six, six, and four. Who cares about that? We've got some replays for you that'll tell you why he really was the MVP. It's bad enough that Baskin actually got the Habwa, uh, probably one of the most contested picks that we've seen so far in competitive play, considering that this guy is banned every single time. And yet, he also manages to steal the Fire Giant from a blink in. And, and you have to wonder, was this really a flaw from Trifecta, not necessarily playing zoning duty or... Is this simply just Baskin with the outplay? And I, I do feel as though there maybe should have been somebody on zone duty, but they were already on guard trying to watch for Anansur, who was lurking yeah. around the corner. There's only so much you can do. You don't expect the blink out wall, especially when the Fire Giant is that close to being eliminated yeah, for your team. Yeah, so close. It is one of those situations where, in hind you know, hindsight being 2020, of course someone needs to zone out the hot wall, but when Anansur's having a performance like this, 7-1 in one on the dodgy, of course he's going to command your respect and and keep all, keep all eyes on him. Uh, prior to that last little couple of team fights, though, a Andy was definitely having a, a little bit of aches and pains throughout this match. Uh, he was working alongside of Baskin really well, though. And uh, again, this last little play here from Andy was, I mean, that's just really pouring salt into the wounds of Trifecta. A beautiful triple ends up turning into a quadra at the end for Aninster. That's how you draw it up for the Dodgy to come play. Clean up crew for you. Again, Anitzer gets the quadra kill, enabled by Baskin blinking in, absorbing a lot of cooldowns, and oh yeah, sealing away your fire giant. Try